by hands-on experience in public administration. He has served or consulted in all branches of government, been involved in the leadership of large organisations and served as a ministerial policy advisor. As Director of the Integrity and Corruption Research Programme for Australia's key centre for ethics, law, justice and governance, Professor Brown led an interdisciplinary team of researchers from four universities in undertaking Australia's first national integrity system assessment. Professor Brown was a project lead on the Whistling While They Work project, the world's largest multidisciplinary whistleblowing research project, which has immediate impacts in Australia and internationally. In May of this year, Chief Legal Advisor to the State Services Commission, Gordon Davis, attended a conference in Sydney where Prof Professor Brown addressed the audience on the topic of whistleblowing. He was so impressed by his presentation that on his return to New Zealand he undertook to bring Professor Brown to Wellington to raise awareness in New Zealand of our own whistleblowing legislation and increase understanding of the um, importance of whistleblowing and the issues and challenges uh, for, for businesses. Although our own whistleblowing legislation was enacted some 12 years ago, it's fair to describe it as the Cinderella of a legislative initiatives supporting public and private integrity. The statute itself is far-reaching and it covers both private and public employees in New Zealand. It offers many protections for people who become aware of serious wrongdoing. But unfortunately, our surveys show that there is a low level of awareness of whistleblowing and the rights and protections of the legislation. Starting today, and armed and informed by the guidance from Professor Brown, we plan to change that and to raise public awareness of the issues involved. I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Brown. Thank you very much, Chris um, and Gordon and the State Services Commission for having me here. It's a delight to be here um, and I'd also like to um, pay my respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered um, and uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, um, not because I come armed with uh, gratuitous advice about what works or doesn't work in Australia when it comes to whistleblowing, but I at least come armed with a bit of information and I hope um, a bit of a snapshot of what's happening in the field of whistleblowing around the world um, that may well be able to inform uh, what's happening in New Zealand, what could happen in New Zealand in what is a vitally important area of public integrity. Some of you might remember about 10 years ago when these three women appeared as the Time magazine Persons of the Year. Um, they, these three women were all uh, associated with revealing information during, uh, before, during or after the aftermath of the last global financial crisis, before this one. In fact, if you remember the collapse of WorldCom and Enron, um, was a huge event internationally, uh, a, a moment where people realised that the uh, business sector in the United States was, uh, didn't have, wasn't functioning with the integrity that uh, many people assumed or trusted that it might be, um, and enormous amounts of uh, reform happened in terms of corporate transparency and, uh, and accountability uh, and integrity after that point, um, only for us to be continuing to realise uh, in subsequent years that the types of problems that, uh, that these three women were pointing to that explained uh, or in, in fact alerted, could have averted um, the collapse of such large multinational companies is a real ongoing problem in our institutions, a problem that in some ways never goes away and that unless we get on top of it, um, uh, we can't expect to really solve or resolve. And really in this 10 years since that period, we've seen a big shift globally in attitudes towards people who speak up about wrongdoing from inside organisations, which is what whistleblowing is about. Once upon a time, I think we believed that whistleblowers were very rare people um, and that they were also quite strange people, uh, that they uh, tended to be either villainous figures, traitors, or they tended to be heroic figures, and sometimes the same people could occupy both stereotypes depending on which particular perspective you looked at their actions from. But the last 10 years, certainly since this uh, Time magazine uh, 
uh, um, front page have really marked a shift, I think, in the, in the mindset of people, certainly in developed countries, also in developing countries worldwide, as to the significance and the importance of whistleblowing as a public integrity and accountability measure. In Australia, we have uh, some notable whistleblowers who also explain really what this whole phenomenon is all about. Andrew Wilkie was a senior analyst in the Office of National Assessments, our premier intelligence coordination agency, former military officer who back in 2003 blew the whistle by going public in the first instance, um, uh, by going public about the fact, the, the fact as we now know it, that uh, the so-called evidence to support the existence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq simply did not exist um, in any way that could support any sustainable case for that being the pretext uh, on which to go to war in Iraq. We now know that that's a fact. Um, but at the time, it was um, quite a courageous act to resign and blow the whistle um, on that being the state of intelligence within uh, Australian, the Australian government and, in fact, within governments worldwide. Andrew Wilkie is now an independent member of, of the Federal Parliament in Australia uh, from Tasmania and last week introduced Australia's uh, first real comprehensive attempt at a federal whistleblower protection bill into the Australian Parliament. That's now a matter of some controversy in Australia. I should disclose that I had no small hand in helping him draft that piece of legislation. Um, I didn't really come here to talk about that. didn't really come, up, come here to beat up the Australian government. Um, I'm here to uh, make friends. Um, but, um, but in full disclosure, that's where, um, that's where the upshot of Andrew Wilkie's efforts lie as of last week. Some of you may be aware of Tony Hoffman, the nurse unit manager from the intensive care unit in Bundaberg Hospital, who in the 2000s was the primary whistleblower in relation to what we often call our Dr Death scandal. Um, Dr Giant Patel was convicted of manslaughter. That conviction was overturned reasonably recently by Australia's High Court. He'll be retried. Um, but um, the disclosure of the serial medical negligence and breakdown of systems in Bundaberg Hospital really triggered a whole new awakening about the state of uh, management and mismanagement in large sections of the public health system in Australia. Um, and finally, just to bring you right up to date in terms of significant Australian whistleblowers, um, just over the last few months in Australia, I don't know if people have been aware in the media of one of the, uh, shall we say, less noble uh, instances or examples of recent Australian uh, public administration and corporate behaviour, which is uh, two government -owned, Australian government-owned companies, Securency, which is 50% owned, and Note Printing Australia, which is 100% owned by Australia's federal government, having uh, pled guilty to foreign bribery charges and various prosecutions of individuals in those companies for engaging in foreign bribery um, are now underway. Brian Hood was the company secretary of Note Printing Australia and some years ago, back in 2007, um, was really the first internally uh, within Note Printing Australia and the Reserve Bank of Australia, who owns these companies, or owns one and owns half of the other, um, who first po started pointing out, as part of his normal corporate duties as company secretary, that there appeared to be no clear justification for why so many millions of dollars would be being paid out to foreign agents being paid to secure contracts for Australia's banknote printing companies in many, 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 many countries um, around the world. Um, and that really the only explanation, and, it's, and so, as it subsequently unfolds, is that in fact uh, quite clearly those huge agents' fees were actually going to pay bribes to foreign officials to enter into or to favour um, the Australian companies in their contracts. It's a bit reminiscent of another famous Australian company called the Australian Wheat Board, which some people may have heard of as well. But, um, but Brian Hood um, was shown the door. Um, and now, subsequently, it's quite clear uh, from his evidence in the prosecutions just how accurate he was, how right he was, um, and, in fact, it's his evidence which is finally helping make sure that there's at least a reasonable chance that, uh, that um, if, if deemed warranted by the court, um, that uh, convictions for those offences will be secured. They're, they're Australia's first uh, prosecutions for foreign bribery offences under the Australian Criminal Code being brought against 
Australian, comp Australian government owned companies and uh, officials of those companies. So those are um, just some examples of Australian whistleblowers in that larger, wider context. Here in New Zealand, you'll have your own experience of uh, people who have blown the whistle. What's significant about um, these three, I guess, is that they cover something of the spectrum of what whistleblowing can involve, everything from uh, the rare individual who resigns and goes public um, as, a, as a major public act of whistleblowing, through to people like Tony Hoffman or Brian Hood, who, in, in Tony Hoffman's case, do everything they can to try and raise concerns internally and through internal channels before eventually, if, it's, if, it, if it wasn't dealt with or wasn't dealt with in a timely fashion, as was the case there, um, ends up with the matter being dragged somehow or other into the media. Uh, and in Brian Hood's case, never went public at all. Blew the whistle internally, uh, did his job, then suffered for it, more or less walked away until uh, later on when the prosecutions were finally brought and his information became quite significant and it became quite clear that had people listened to him in the first place, uh, possibly this could have all been handled much, much better. So they, that provides some snapshot of different types of whistleblowing, all of it important um, and um, all of it uh, relevant to the types of experiences uh, that whistleblowers undergo and the types of roles that whistleblowers play, in, in my experience, everywhere. Um, just to be clear on what whistleblowing is, as you can tell from the examples I've already given, I'm talking here today about whistleblowing being uh, the revelation or the disclosure of wrongdoing or suspected wrongdoing by people inside organisations, usually employees, um, but other people like contractors or volunteers can also fit into that kind of category. Um, there are lots of distinctions that can be drawn between, uh, and, and that some people might argue with, but about, dis about making distinctions between whistleblowing and other types of disclosure, um, other types of revelation of information, um, and also there are distinctions that can be made about when is whistleblowing about revealing uh, wrongdoing or information that might re relate to wrongdoing in the, that's somehow in the public interest that deserves all the attention that it might get from authorities or uh, ultimately from the public. Um, and when is the disclosure about wrongdoing something that relates more to personal grievances or industrial matters? And what's the, what, what are the overlaps between those? And how do we put in place laws and procedures and systems that deal with the sort of full spectrum of wrongdoing that people might need to disclose inside organisations or about organisations? But I won't dwell on those distinctions now. We can talk about them if there are questions, and I'll certainly be talking about them um, in some of the other discussions that I'm having with the State Services Commission and, and others um, while I'm here. Um, but what's really important is to be thinking not just about what whistleblowing is, but why do we do we asking the question, do we really value it, and why do we value it? And what I'd like to do is, is address that question for a moment um, and then come around to talking about, well, how much whistleblowing actually goes on. I started out by saying we used to have a stereotype of whistleblowing as being quite a rare thing. Um, so I'd like to address the question of how much whistleblowing actually goes on based on uh, what we now know from research that I've been involved in and others have been involved in. Um, what are the outcomes from whistleblowing? What actually happens? What, what's our latest picture of, of how it all ends up for whistleblowers but also for organisations? Um, and I'll come back at the end to uh, the question of what kind of legislative regime or whistleblower protection regime uh, we think we need to have in any jurisdiction in Australia at the moment, um, but also perhaps here in New Zealand to best support, to recognise and support and value and maximise, in fact, the role of whistleblowing as a public integrity measure. Um, I haven't come here to lecture you on, on what New Zealand should do, but arising from the research that's been going on in Australia and internationally and what we know about good practice, current best practice in terms of uh, legislative approaches around the world, it's certainly a good time to be thinking about, OK, well, how you know, is there a case for strengthening New Zealand's systems and approach in this respect? And if so, how would you do that? But just to go back to that initial question about why we value whistleblowers, um, it's easy to get distracted by the fact that very often if whistleblowers do end up in the media, it automatically, they automatically have public interest just because it becomes so fascinating, because they appear to be heroic figures or because there's a battle of 
of David and Goliath going on or because of the salacious material that they um, reveal or might reveal. But um, for me, um, the value is actually um, fundamentally utilitarian. It sounds terrible to say it. Um, but I first became involved in whistleblowing issues as an investigator for the Australian uh, Federal Ombudsman's Office um, when I um, just couldn't believe the value that whistleblowers had as sources of information in the course of investigating what was going wrong and right, but often wrong, within the public service. Um, and to me, this um, particular example of a whistleblower uh, sums up many of the quintessential elements of, of um, why I think we do fundamentally and should um, value whistleblowing. This gentleman was in charge of foreign exchange for the National Australia Bank, one of Australia's big four banks, some of you have probably heard of it, um, who uh, was responsible for, uh, he and, and others were responsible for rogue trading in foreign exchange transactions in the National Australia Bank in Melbourne um, uh, a few years ago, several years ago. Um, and we're losing lots and lots of shareholders' money and depositors' money. Um, and um, the, the question was, well, what, how long was this going to go on before somebody actually did something about it or, or detected it? And ultimately, uh, it was detected and investigated and sorted out, and ultimately, um, this particular gentleman was, was one who was convicted of an offence in relation to it. But what was really interesting was, uh, was what the National Australia Bank did in relation to this particular matter. Um, this is the ABC News Online report of uh, the, from the time that this matter was being disclosed publicly and the Corporate Affairs Manager for the National Australia Bank um, when explaining uh, to the inquiring media what was happening explained that yes indeed this, this particular road trading was uncovered by a whistleblower. Um, a colleague on the trading floor, the trading desk uh, in the trading floor in Melbourne. Now that whistleblower has never been publicly identified to my knowledge. Never, certainly never identified themselves, never went public just did the right thing. To my knowledge, um, National Australia Bank never did anything to identify them. I've never heard anything to suggest that this whistleblower suffered repercussions as a consequence. I'll come back to suffering um, and repercussions uh, a little bit later. I doubt that this was necessarily an easy thing or a happy phase of that particular individual's life. But the, per but the, the, but the point is, this individual, to my knowledge, was not hung out to dry by anybody. Um, and you can see he's not being hung out to dry there by the National Australia Bank. The crucial thing about it is what the National Australia Bank said next, um, that uh, described that the fact that this, that this person did blow the whistle internally, that it triggered all the right actions. Um, and then later on that, in that little report, uh, it says, despite being uncovered by a whistleblower, Mr Hadler says the bank systems would have detected the foreign exchange fraud in due course. The trades were unauthorised and not properly recorded and that's why they, why they weren't picked up in the first instance by the systems. And there, in my book, you have um, the quintessential element why whistleblowers are so significant. Because we can have all the accountability systems, we can have the audits, we can have the automatic computer systems checking transactions and what's going on, looking for red flag issues, looking for aberrations, um, looking for budgets that don't balance, looking for where procedures might not have been followed. But when you talk about things going wrong in organisation, especially if there's an element of uh, deceit involved or deliberate wrongdoing or mistakes being made that then people are deliberately trying to cover up for normal human reasons, then you're talking about actions which are designed to escape systems. They're designed to, to elude systems. Um, and so it's only the smartest, most adaptive systems um, that can even have a chance of trying to keep pace real time with what might be going wrong in any organisation at any particular time. But human beings aren't like that. People working in organisations aren't like that. Um, they see things, they notice things, they get annoyed about things, things that are going wrong start to affect them, start to affect their careers, start to affect their sense of what's, uh, what's, what's consistent or not consistent with the corporate mission. And human beings can then do something about it. They can speak up about it. So as a trigger for uh, making organisations and regulators and the broader public aware of 
things that are going wrong in organisations earlier rather than later and in a highly accurate, attuned, finger on the pulse, finger on the, on the na- you know, hammer on the nail type of fashion, um, there is nothing uh, in our experience, our institutional experience and our social experience like the, the whistleblower for fulfilling that function. Now, we actually increasingly, as a result of research, know this to be uh, a fact and something that is um, verified by the perception of people who work in management. I won't ask sort of all internal auditors in the, in the room to put up their hands, but I bet there's more than a few, um, and I bet that you know exactly what I'm talking about now. Um, but what we've uh, had the privilege to do in Australia is to be involved in... Um, some very comprehensive research into how much whistleblowing uh, goes on in the Australian public sector uh, and what the outcomes are of it. And I won't labour you through all of the research, but just to give you some idea of the scope of the project, um, the single largest survey, and there were a number of different surveys as part of the project, uh, the single largest survey is one that captured a data set of 7,663 responses from public servants from four different Australian jurisdictions, the federal government and three states, um, taken from 118 different federal, state and local agencies. Um, And the reason why that's significant is because we are um, now capable of doing more of that kind of research much more efficiently and easily around the world than we used to be. Just by way of comparison, and this is not to denigrate the study that's involved, but really previously, until uh, the last decade or so, research into whistleblowing was really relying on quite small samples from disparate organisations at different times. I think the most recent study of whistleblowing in New Zealand was one, and this is quite a familiar and and recognised methodology published in the Journal of Business Ethics in 2009 that relied on 51 senior accounting students from... um, one of New Zealand's universities. Now, that's, that's quite regular around the world to see people do quite valid and significant research into whistleblowing attitudes and whistleblowing propensity using samples of students and social scientists are familiar with this. But, um, but uh, with the participation of government agencies uh, and uh, numerous universities, uh, there's now a growing interest in conducting much larger scale research that really does give an accurate picture of what's really going on Uh, in organisations and being able to compare those organisations, public sector or private sector. Um, So so quite a lot of this research is is published in detail in a couple of uh, reports and books from this particular study. Um, I won't um, wave them around, but I wanted to put them up here on the screen just so that people were aware of them. Um, because they're free to download from the Australian and New Zealand School of Government Research Series website. Um, And this presentation will be available if anybody wants it afterwards via the State Services Commission. So those of you who want to get their hands on it and make use of any of the references and track down the sources, um, it'll be be readily available. Um, But I just wanted to mention that there is this research background. And part of our research, uh, we um, specifically asked samples in our public sector organisations, we specifically asked samples of managers and case handlers, that's people like internal auditors, uh, internal ethics officers, people who are handling the management of wrongdoing and integrity and accountability and governance issues in organisations. We asked them how important are different avenues for for bringing to light wrongdoing in their organisation. And you might just think in your own mind about the different options that are up on the screen there, from routine internal controls to internal audits to management observation to accident. Somebody goes on leave and the person who inherited their job couldn't believe what they found in the desk. Um, Those sorts of things. Um, um, And you might like to think, well, how would you rank those? Which would you regard as being most important? Um, One being not important and four being extremely important. Um, So having thought about it yourself, and really I've already given you the answer, um, what the research showed was that uh, when you you interview random samples of managers and case handlers within organisations, even the managers agree that uh, reporting by employees is 
um, at least as important on average, across their, their averaged views, um, at least as important as any other of those means of wrongdoing coming to light in organisations. Um, the average manager uh, ranked reporting by employees as sort of equally the most important to management observation, i.e. their own observation, as being the means by which wrongdoing came to light. The other groups uh, ranked it significantly as the single most important. Um, and that verifies on a much broader basis from, from a large uh, pool of organisations uh, what we know from a story like that National Australia Bank story, um, that we are dealing here with a crucial source of information about what's going wrong and right, but often wrong, um, in organisations. Um, it's really important also to recognise that, uh, in the, certainly in the last 10 years, and perhaps this was always the case beforehand, uh, there is widespread public recognition of the role and the value of whistleblowing. Um, we're currently conducting with the University of Melbourne a project called the World Online Whistleblowing Survey, and if you want to Google that up and complete the survey, it's still running, the online version, so please do feel free to do that. Um, the more the merrier. It's quite, for the, for the research design involved, it's quite um, legitimate just to have anybody and everybody's opinion. It doesn't matter that it's self-selecting. Um, so feel free to... Uh, to complete the survey by Googling up the World Online Whistleblowing Survey or using whichever other favourite web browser is yours. Um, but um, as well as this, we've been looking at public attitudes more generally to whistleblowing. So in Australia and in some countries overseas, we've just done it in the UK, um, asking questions about how people in general perceive whistleblowing. So you might like to think about how you would answer these questions. Um, Basically, we didn't use the term whistleblowing because for some people that's still pejorative and, uh, and conjures up all sorts of stereotypes, some too negative, some too positive. So we just described it as basically being about people in organisations <laughs> revealing inside information um, about wrongdoing, um, serious wrongdoing. Um, and so we asked these questions. So think about which of these you would agree with um, more. Uh, in Australian society or, say, New Zealand society, uh, it is generally unacceptable for people to speak up about serious wrongdoing if you'd have to reveal inside information. Um, or it's generally acceptable to speak up about serious wrongdoing, even if it does mean revealing inside information or breaking a confidence. Um, and um, what's interesting about that is that it, 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 it's, a, it's a sort of an ambivalent picture, if you like. In Australia, about half of all Australians do think it's generally acceptable in Australian society for people to speak up about serious wrongdoing, even if it means revealing inside information. Um, but you've still got between a quarter and a third saying that it's unacceptable, that as a general rule in society, we don't think that that's acceptable. And about 20, up to almost 20% sitting on the fence saying, well, I don't really know. Um, but what's uh, significant about that is that it, it, you might think that it's a... Um, a fairly high rating of for the acceptability, the perceived acceptability of whistleblowing, but it certainly confirms that there's sort of an ambivalence. We tend to believe, a lot of people tend to believe or they're not sure about whether as a society we think this is a good thing or not. But if you actually ask people what they think is a good thing as opposed to what they think the rest of society thinks, then, and, and so this is the questions at the bottom, then you actually get a bit of a different picture. So if if you think about those questions, which would you choose as being closest to your opinion out of those two questions at the bottom? Um, what we get in Australia is certainly an overwhelming uh, confirmation from the general public that people should be supported for revealing serious wrongdoing, even if it means revealing inside information, um, as against uh, those who believe that people who reveal inside information should be punished, even if they're revealing serious wrongdoing. And um, what this goes towards, I'll come back to some more figures in a moment, what this goes towards is a, is a basic question of, uh, of what the degree of social or public tolerance is of the whistleblowing phenomenon. We now no longer believe, I've never really believed, that Australia was an anti-dobbing society, which I believe is also something that sometimes people say of New Zealand, that you know, nobody likes a dobber. Um, but in fact, at the same time, uh, we're a very egalitarian society, and my trips to New Zealand tell me that New Zealand is also a very egalitarian society where people are quite capable of saying, well, 
you know, this is not fair. There but for the grace of God go I. If I was in that situation, what would I have done? Um, you know, do we really expect people to have to put up with this stuff? Um, so, um, so I think it's really important to recognise when, in fact, contrary to some commentators or political leaders' opinions, um, that, in fact, there is a high social recognition of the value of whistleblowing as well. Whether it's got higher in the last 10 years um, or not, we don't know for sure, but there's good reason to believe that it is, that generally attitudes have changed from being uncertain to being much clearer about the value of whistleblowing. Now, in our research, we uh, managed to achieve some new snapshots of just how much whistleblowing actually goes on in organisations. Uh, and this is significant because of that uh, stereotype that I mentioned earlier about whistleblowing supposedly being a very, very rare thing. Um, and this uh, is a very significant public policy issue because uh, the question of how we go about recognising the value of whistleblowing, uh, acknowledging its role, recognising when people have blown the whistle internally, uh, and then making sure that measures are in place to support those people and to act on their, those, their concerns, these are all really, really important practical questions that flow from our recognition of the value of whistleblowing. Um, and obviously legislation like the Protective Disclosures Act and like equivalent legislation uh, in Australia and in the US and in the UK and increasingly other countries around the world is intended to put in place frameworks that will help make sure that all those sorts of things happen. So it's useful to know how much actually is going on um, that is supposed to be being served by these frameworks, these very important public integrity frameworks. So without going through um, the whole of the way in which we did our analysis in these surveys, what we established was that on a very conservative estimate, because the nature of this process is that it will result in a conservative estimate, um, out of our survey of 7,663 public servants, we came up with a figure, um, or what the results showed was that uh, one, even if you break it down to a very core group of people who we can say with some confidence fit the basic category of people being people who blew the whistle on public interest related wrongdoing, um, who, who, who saw the wrongdoing, who reported it, who weren't reporting it because they were a manager reporting their own employee for some sort of misconduct or something, who they were basically reporting it outside their normal organisational role um, and that it was public interest related, then it came down to 12% um, of our very, very, very large sample. Um, so that was over a, a two-year period, 12% of all public servants um, in that sample having uh, blown the whistle. Um, and that's actually quite a low number compared to some equivalent large studies in the US, for example, which point to much higher numbers. But we know that this is a very solid number, that it's a very conservative estimate. Now, in Australia, if you extrapolate, and this was done across four different government jurisdictions, 118 agencies, um, so it's a big figure. I mean, it's a big, it's a big result. Um, but if you extrapolated that across the entire of the Australian public sector, public sector employment, it would amount to 197,000 public servants over a two-year period doing that. If you uh, extrapolated that same figure to the core government administration employees in New Zealand, which I'm reliably informed is 36,475 full-time equivalents, um, then the figure would be 4,337 uh, public servants in New Zealand from core government administration, if, if the same figure applied in New Zealand. And that's a significant number of people fulfilling that sort of role. You, know, you can raise all sorts of questions about the seriousness and how these things should be handled. I'm not suggesting that because these people are all whistleblowers, it, it means that automatically uh, men in black combat suits should be abseiling out of helicopters, kicking in windows and telling everybody to lie on the floor while we protect these people. Um, but, um, but what it does point to is the fact that there is a large group of people out there on whom the integrity of the public sector relies pretty much every day. Um, from the fact that they're prepared to speak up with their concerns about wrongdoing. Um, and so the question is whether we've got the systems and the procedures, the public sector management systems, um, the legal protections in place to actually recognise and manage anything like that sort of number of people. This is a really interesting issue, and this is a really interesting issue for the State Services Commission here, and it, but it's not, uh, certainly New Zealand is not alone in this, uh, because 
typically under whistleblowing legislation so far in, uh, in the experience of most jurisdictions, it tends to either attract or pick up much, much, much smaller proportions of people than the likely real body of public interest whistleblowers that are actually out there in the public service. Um, and this table from our research gives some analysis of this. I won't go through it in detail, but just, this is partly there to assure you that New Zealand is not alone like this, um, that, um, that it's very easy to put in place whistleblower protection legislation, which appears to be irrelevant because it's not attracting lots of disclosures, even though we now know that there's actually quite a lot of whistleblowing going on out there. Um, probably the nearest comparison is in Western Australia, where the legislation um, is problematic in various ways, where they've only putting, been putting a lot of effort into it, um, and over the period that we were studying, uh, there were only uh, six in total for the entire Western Australian government, uh, six public interest disclosures. But that compares to other jurisdictions like New South Wales, where well, it's a much bigger government, but you can see the disproportion here, where agencies, different agencies, are recognising and reporting and managing vastly larger numbers of whistleblowing incidents as public interest disclosures under their legislation, 4,631. So somewhere between these really, really small numbers of the, of, of public servants who are making disclosures that are being recognised as such under the legislation and this larger pool of people who are actually blowing the whistle, there is a number in there for what's the right number that the system should be picking up and recognising and should be, um, should be uh, offering legal protections to and offering practical protections to and triggering public sector management systems that will help make sure that those people are being managed appropriately. In all instances, there should be systems for making sure that whatever the concerns are, whether they're small scale or whether they're really serious, that those concerns are being dealt with. Um, but the uh, focus, a lot of the focus here is on what are the systems that will actually help make sure that uh, the whistleblower um, doesn't suffer unnecessarily for their role in the whole experience. Um, most whistleblowing is internal, and you can you can see that from everything I've said so far. It's a very small proportion of people who ever go public. Um, it's an even tinier proportion of people who are like Andrew Wilkie, our intelligence officer who, who resigned and went public on the same night. Um, very strategic. You can tell he was a military officer. Um, but, the, um, but most public servants will, will blow the whistle internally. They'll, talk, they'll tell their supervisor um, in the first instance, even when Six months later, they'll realise that that was not a smart thing to do. Um, but that's what most people will do, because most, most people actually want to trust their organisations, and most people like to trust their own management. Um, and, um, and so um, the, um, the normal course of action is that people, most whistleblowers only end up going public after a long history of their disclosure having either not been dealt with properly, um, they, some people end up fighting on and going public because they're wrong, actually, um, and they've just turned into obsessed complainants, um, and that's true, but it's actually quite a small proportion, our research suggests. Most people end up um, fighting on with a disclosure and it turning into a battle and a career battle for them um, and wanting to go public, whether they can get a hearing from a journalist or not, um, because they realise that contrary to their instincts that they should, should be able to trust everybody, that in fact not everybody really wanted to hear this information and that there was a whole lot of issues that exploded onto the scene that they hadn't anticipated, uh, which means that unless they can get a positive investigation outcome or vindication from their disclosure, they realise that in fact in their organisation they're really up for a hard time. Um, so there are various logical, practical reasons, human reasons, uh, reasons that are explained by organisational psychology for why people end up um, becoming um, uh, locked into uh, internal disclosures as um, such a huge and sometimes destructive part of their careers. But it doesn't always have to be like that. Um, and um, just to skip forward a slide, um, the... Uh, what we know from our research is that, in fact, contrary to some myths from our very large-scale research, not all whistleblowers actually suffer. Um, in fact, it's something like about a quarter of our whistleblowers said that they regarded themselves as having been treated badly by 
uh, either co-workers or more usually by the management of their organisation as a result of blowing the whistle. And that's quite a small figure. It's still a lot of people. Um, but it's, it's much smaller than many people expected. What we now know from this research is that a lot of the difficulties that before whistleblowers don't necessarily come from direct reprisals. They come from really collateral damage, death by a thousand cuts. Um, just the difficulties of surviving in an organisation that's become affected by the, the conflict of having whatever the alleged wrongdoing is revealed um, and having them known or identified as having been played a particular role in the unravelling of these issues. And so what's really become much more uh, important in terms of a, a system response and a public sector management response and a legislative response is recognising that, that um, saying thou shalt not undertake a reprisal against a whistleblower is one thing, and, you know, and thou shalt not, and you know, thou shalt be punished if one is caught doing that as it should be. But the reality is that a lot of the career disadvantage and the detriment that befalls whistleblowers comes from, um, comes from that sort of collateral damage. Um, and we don't, as, as organisations, we're not really very good at recognising that fact. This is a quote from one of our whistleblowers in our research um, who, um, who we classed as a good outcome. Did not say they were badly treated by management or by their um, by their co-workers, um, but you can just read that for yourself. He reported the, the largest fraud the organisation has ever experienced. It was a very large public sector organisation in Australia. Um, and everything went right. It was, he was listened to, it was investigated. He didn't regard himself as suffer, having suffered any reprisals. But even in the best case scenario, it was a life and career changing experience. He never wanted to be in that situation again. Um, and so, uh, there's no escaping the stress and the collateral career damage that can befall people, even in the best possible situation, let alone all the situations where, uh, where people blow the whistle and they are allowed to become collateral damage by their organisation because it's just really hard. I mean, it's actually what our research showed is that organisations are actually quite good at recognising when people speak up or provide information about wrongdoing, they're quite good at being like the National Australia Bank and actually investigating it and jumping on it and sorting it out. But the whistleblower still is left as the collateral damage. It's just like too hard to either prevent or contain or find an alternative career path, etc. Um, so really the, the, the onus on uh, managers, and this is public sector and private sector, becomes, well, what can we do about that? What can we do to actually uh, minimise and contain reprisals and adverse outcomes for people who have basically just done the right thing or mostly just done the right thing? There may have been a history of workplace conflict and disagreement and very often that will be the case in a, in a workplace where there is wrongdoing or where things have been going wrong for a while. We know often those are workplaces that are difficult to classify as anything other than dysfunctional anyway. So it becomes a very difficult nest of issues to unpack in, in, in many, many, in most contexts. But nevertheless, what is the, the, the uh, obligation on the organisation to actually try and minimise, sort out those issues in a way which is fair and just for all the people involved, but certainly especially for the whistleblower? If it can't be done, then what are the mechanisms for compensating that person and letting them get on with an alternative career or a, or a new career. So those are the questions that arise from this sort of new, more nuanced picture of uh, what really goes on uh, as a result of whistleblowing. Um, I'll skip over some of these statistics. Some of you are involved in some meetings where we might get in to go into them in more detail. But what we really, um, what we really found from all this research was that. Um, even in jurisdictions like in Australia where there was quite strong whistleblowing protection, our public sector agencies were generally um, falling down quite badly on the job when it came to actually thinking about their practical systems for managing internally reported wrongdoing and the people involved inside those organisations. The beauty of this research was that there was massive safety in numbers um, and all the agencies were anonymous, um, but they got their own results and stats and knew where they how they compared to the other agencies uh, in this whole data set and um, 
could see that even in some situations where the legislation was really, really bad, some agencies did a fantastic job relatively in terms of managing their whistleblowers. Um, there was good, solid empirical evidence of the fact that they were getting better outcomes on a whole range of uh, statistical measures arising from this research, including the proportion of whistleblowers who were saying that they were mistreated. Um, and then on the other hand, in every jurisdiction we studied, there were agencies that were doing it really, really badly. Uh, in some cases, even when the legislation in theory was really very good. Uh, I come from Queensland where until recently the legislation was probably the best. On average, Queensland agencies scored the lowest on many of the indicators um, that arose from this research. So all of this, uh, if that sounds a bit complicated, uh, it's really intended to, um, to get the message home that actually it's what happens at the organisational level that's the key, that managers make a difference. What happens within the organisation is the crucial thing. Your organisation can have a really good whistleblowing policy, can have really good strategies for recognising uh, what should happen if people do report wrongdoing in terms of both dealing with the information um, but also the support that's available for managing the whistleblowers and others involved in the issue. And that it's at that agency level uh, that really all the critical get decisions get made that will determine uh, whether there are better or worse outcomes from most of the vast bulk of uh, whistleblowing incidents. Um, I'll skip over a couple of slides just to make sure we've got plenty of time for questions and I might come back to um, some of them if any of your questions bear upon them. Um, but um, I wanted to save some time for getting back to the fundamental question of so what kind of regime, what kind of sort of legal or regulatory regime um, should we be looking at in order to support uh, best practice in the management of whistleblowing. And what's really important here to recognise is that all around the world there's been a lot of confusion about what types of legal strategies to adopt that would put in place the triggers or the drivers or the obligations that would, um, that would encourage, A, encourage people to blow the whistle uh, when otherwise they would remain silent. And that's a crucial objective of any kind of whistleblowing policy or legislation. Um, but also to make sure that that, those, that information is then managed appropriately, that action is taken where, where appropriate, that the matters are dealt with. Um, and thirdly, to protect and support whistleblowers, to make sure that they don't um, emerge with unduly adverse outcomes. And around the world, there's really been four different types of legal approach taken underpinning um, different legislation. In the United States, it really started with what we call the anti-retaliation anti model. Um, the anti-retaliation model, which is... Uh, basically about the theory that, OK, if you, if you outlaw reprisals and you give people the rights to compensation for reprisals, they'll be protected um, and therefore they're more likely to blow the whistle. That's turned out not to really be the case. Um, but certainly those models need to work if whistleblowers who do suffer reprisals are ever to be compensated in those situations where compensation is the right remedy. Um, um, so there's been a lot of difficulty getting those types of um, anti-retaliation, uh, um, organisational justice uh, elements of whistleblower protection legislation to work. Um, also in the US, almost as an alternative to the difficulty of those, there's been enormous use of what, a, what you might call reward or bounty models. And I'll skip over those, but if people have got questions about the US False Claims Act or similar types of legislation, then feel free to, to ask them in a moment. Um, uh, but what we've been focused on here, apart from having anti-retaliation and compensation mechanisms in our legislation which basically haven't worked in Australia, um, we've focused really on two things. Traditionally, we've focused on what, what's now called internationally the structural model and really Australian legislation was the lead for this to say, well, we put in place an administrative and a regula regulatory framework that says that public servants... And, and here we're, we're talking about Australian public sector legislation because it's, there's a big black hole when it comes to private sector whistleblowing legislation. But the public servants should blow the whistle, that they can blow the whistle. Here's who they could blow the whistle to. This is how their agency, their agency should put in place procedures for managing the whistleblowing. These are the people who should investigate it. This is how it should be dealt with. 
sort of a, a good, clear regulatory framework for making sure that people um, do the right thing and play their roles in the, um, in the process. Um, and as a result of our, partly as a result of our research, there's been a lot of upgrading going on to that, how that structural model looks in Australian legislation, and it's also being picked up or developed in parallel in other places around the world, including in the US. There's now a much, much stronger focus in the US on putting in place those sorts of operational systems and procedures for managing whistleblowing, giving them a legislative base. And there are elements of that in the New Zealand Protective Disclosures Act as well. The big thing that has also changed enormously, um, was already changing rapidly before the advent of WikiLeaks, but really the modern information age has accelerated it, is recognising the role of public whistleblowing as part of the entire process. And this is, a, this is an area in which Australia has been moving quite rapidly, but other countries have as well, to, um, uh, to deal with what was really a very big gap in a lot of 1990s whistleblower protection legislation, which was to say, somewhat naively when you think about it, looking back, that, OK, if we get all those internal systems and procedures in, right, uh, in place, they're working right, that public servants will be able to blow the whistle internally or to the ombudsman or whoever, and that they... Um, that then uh, that it'll, all, it'll all be dealt with, everything will be fine, and they'll never, ever need to go public. There, there just isn't any excuse for going public because the system will work, um, and so public whistleblowing is never going to be required, so there won't be any legal protections for people who go public. We've got to keep it all in-house. Now, to many of us, when you look at that in the cold, hard light of day, uh, was, that was never likely to be the case. Um, in a liberal democracy... We've always seemed to have relied on the fact that at the end of the day there will always be circumstances where people need to go public um, and that we value it. Very often we end up valuing it when they do. Uh, in New Zealand you have somewhat stronger protection for basic human rights than we do in Australia um, in a large part, including thing, things like the right to free speech. So to some extent this may be compensated for elsewhere. But uh, in Australia a lot of the legislation was framed around the assumption that whistleblowers couldn't go public. It was, a, it was keep it all in-house legislation. That's now changed very, very rapidly um, to, uh, to include in our whistleblowing legislation the recognition that if it, if it, if it isn't dealt with properly internally um, or there are other exceptional circumstances, if there are no safe channels, then yes, we would rather, as a society, we would rather have a whistleblower go public than stay silent. Uh, and there are various protections and hoops and hurdles you can put in place um, to govern that scenario, uh, but that that's the bottom line for, um, for a lot of development in whistleblowing legislation. The um, uh, significant thing is that we know from our research that this is a really good driver for organisations to get it right. That in those jurisdictions where this is a real... where, where, where there is statutory recognition of the legitimacy of people going public, that it is a very good incentive for organisations to say, well, what's our best chance of avoiding that? Well, we better get our own systems in order so that we can legitimately say that we dealt with it well and that, um, that, uh, that there was no excuse for this uh, to go public. So I've, I've included in the slides um, a table giving a rundown on, on the three crucial areas of of reform in Australian whistleblowing legislation by jurisdiction uh, from the most recently reformed um, to, the, um, to the stalled um, and in each of those three areas, those operational or structural systems, the recognition of public disclosure or public whistleblowing and then the third issue is effective compensation remedies for whistleblowers who suffer. So even in Australia where we're doing lots and lots of hard work on this, um, there's been quite a lot of reform in the first of those categories. There's ongoing reform, which is well underway in the second of those categories. But in fact, when it comes to effective uh, mechanisms for properly compensating the anti-retaliation anti model, if you like, of whistleblowing, um, there isn't an Australian jurisdiction you can point to where really there is an effective, a simple and effective uh, system for making sure that whistleblowers are easily compensated when they should be um, for what they suffer. Um, uh, it's important to note that we're not alone like this. Jurisdictions like the UK have had public whistleblowing as part of their uh, regime since 1998. 
since before the New Zealand Protective Disclosures Act, in fact, and before quite a few bits of Australian legislation that didn't have this. Um, and the United Kingdom regime is focused all upon giving uh, whistleblowers easy access to the Employment Appeals Tribunal system to get real compensation for the damage that uh, has, has happened to their career. It's got none of the structural model or operational model that I was describing, um, but on these other two issues it's got, it's got very strong elements of those models. So you can see that internationally there's an enormous amount of learning going on as to what elements are key elements to these regimes, how they should be reflected in legislation, um, and what works and what doesn't, with different jurisdictions leaping ahead of others on different elements of what it would take to get a comprehensive package in place. So this is the rich landscape within which New Zealand sits. And I just wanted to, um, uh, to finish by just addressing that question, what's all this got to do with New Zealand? The good news is you've got a Protective Disclosures Act. Whether that's the absolute best title for it is probably a good question. In most jurisdictions these days, it's called the Public Interest Disclosure Act. There are reasons for that. Um, and it covers the public sector and the private sector. So it covers all employers and employees. It covers volunteers. Um, and these are fundamentally good elements. You, you can do some of these things more easily in a non-federal country. Um, so full marks to you for that. Um, but, the, um, but I guess when you've got legislation which uh, statistically the number of disclosures that are supposedly being made under the legislation is very, very small. That's unlikely to be the reality of what's really going on in organisations. And it's unlikely to be the reality of the people who are out there blowing the whistle who need some institutional support or statutory backup or statutory rights um, of the kind that this type of legislation is supposed to provide. So I think there's a real question for New Zealand um, about the current state of knowledge, about what's really happening out there uh, just in the public sector, let alone in the private sector, in terms of the role that whistleblowing is playing and how much is actually going on, um, and how it's being handled, what the management responses are, whether people are being supported or not, which organisations have good functioning whistleblowing policies and how they operationalise them, um, and which ones hadn't, haven't even thought about it, um, and what the outcomes are from those, those processes. Um, and I'm in, the, uh, in the, I'm in the knowledge game, obviously. I'm a research advocate because I do research. Um, but um, irrespective of you know, who does the research for New Zealand, it's really, really important that, uh, that these types of issues are approached from a knowledge base um, so that, uh, so that the, uh, the, um, the, the consequences or the next steps can be designed based on real information. But there are some other logical questions about the New Zealand framework that, that doesn't, don't necessarily mean that it's not doing its job, because it may well be that even without people having a higher level of awareness of that particular piece of legislation, that it's having a positive impact. Undoubtedly, I'm sure that it's had a positive impact on people recognising that this is an important issue, and that filters into the way in which many, many organisations work. Um, but in terms of how well it's doing its job practically, um, there are logical questions that we can ask now in the light of what's been happening internationally about how the settings in the legislation uh, might be set in the ways that are most conducive to recognising all the types of reporting behaviour that should be captured, delivering all the types of remedies that should be available, um, providing agencies and managers with the flexibility they need to manage things in a horses-for-courses fashion, um, and uh, a whole range of other issues. Um, so I've just put those questions um, on a slide for further discussion with the State Services Commission and with any other interested parties as being ones that are worthwhile visiting without um, throwing away the fact, and, and this is probably um, the right note to finish on, um, and then I'll welcome questions, um, without throwing away the fact that New Zealand, like many jurisdictions, not all, but many jurisdictions in Australia, um, is broadly ahead of the game on many of these issues. Um, broadly, we can take pride, and I think New Zealand can take pride, in the quality of its public sector, um, possibly even the quality of its private sector. And, um, and that these... Uh, we, we off, we're in the fortunate situation, countries like Australia and New Zealand, New Zealand even more than Australia, uh, if you believe the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, um, 
as being um, right at the front of the game in terms of quality of public administration. So to, so to suggest that there might be room for improvement to me uh, is never to suggest that things are in a woeful state, but um, it's only by staying ahead of the game when it comes to public integrity and accountability, especially in this day and age, especially in the world we all live in, um, that we can expect to um, be able to say with true confidence that, uh, that we have the public sector and the quality of government and the integrity of government um, to which we would aspire. So fundamentally, um, whistleblowers are, in, in my book, are our assets. People are our best assets. Um, in any organisation, uh, our best assets are always our people. And, uh, and I hope the discussion today has given you some of the evidence for why whistleblowers as a group of people are part of that um, particularly important category of the best assets in our organisations when it comes to public integrity and public accountability, not just now, but moving forward for, I suspect, a very, very long time. So thank you very much. Now, I'm, I'm told that there's a bit of time for questions, um, at least 20 or 25 minutes, so that's time for a few questions. But I'm also told if you can keep your questions relatively brief, that helps me make sure my answers are relatively brief. Um, and um, if you wouldn't mind telling me who you are and where you're from when you ask your question, that also may help me keep my answer a little bit more tailored to what you're asking. And the gentleman up the back there is the first cab off the rank. Martin Lally, Victoria University. Um, I'd like to ask you a question based on our personal experience of mine. You raised the concern of the Chancellor of this university about something that I thought was unethical and possible. Okay, provided you keep it a short story. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I really, it's difficult for me to comment really without knowing any of the details of the matter. Um, in some situations, organisations quite justifiably will go to top level legal advice for different issues. They may also be good forensic investigators. So I can't, I can't suggest that that's necessarily a, you know, an overreaction. Um, what I will say in response to your question, which probably won't help you, is that universities have a very, very difficult time with dealing with uh, many of the issues that other types of organisations deal with, uh, are challenged by, but, um, but somehow man or other managed to deal with them pretty well. Actually, when we did our research, there was a big uh, argument that we should include lots of universities in our sample of agencies. I pled with my research team that we shouldn't do that because I knew um, how um, difficult the issues might well be. Um, but, um, but I think what that does is emphasise that um, no organisation... There are different types of organisations that can quite easily see themselves as different from the public sector or different from the private sector or different from the market and occupying a special place in the world. And universities tend to be like that, as well as being large and quite differently organised organisations. So um, designing these types of systems and procedures to serve universities is a particular challenge um, and, um, and, uh, and I probably should just leave it at that. Um, if, if, if this university is like any other Australian universities then it wouldn't be immune from those challenges. Uh, but there's a, um, it, all of that is a, is a big reason for the agencies that are meant to be supporting the development of these sorts of systems to make sure that they do put quite a lot of effort into not forgetting about universities. I can't really say anything more than that. There's got to be another question. Or two. Yes? And my understanding is that there's, there is or isn't currently a provision in the Protected Disclosures Act that allows anonymous disclosures, or is the 
legislation silent on that. Can anyone tell, enlighten me? I can look it up quickly. But. So it is possible. Yeah, it's it's a very important issue whether you can whether you can and should be able to make anonymous disclosures. The reality is that, um, and as so as we've just heard, the situation here at the moment is under the Protective Disclosures Act. Yes, it, yes, you can. Um, under legislation in in a number of jurisdictions, that's not left to any doubt. In that, very often it's made explicit that it's a protected it, it's a public interest disclosure and therefore attracts the protections irrespective of whether somebody can be identified. So basically, if, if, if it's an anonymous disclosure but you can demonstrate later that it was you, then you will still be able to claim the protections. The important thing about anonymity, um, and I know many people in the room, if you've had any role in the integrity system or internal audit or complaint management, you'll know this, is that, um, in fact, the beauty of making it quite clear that, that uh, anonymous disclosures will be welcomed is that anonymous disclosures are the first step towards many disclosures that otherwise would not happen, that may well, see, may well not be anonymous. They're actually the invitation to make confidential disclosures. Very often people will, will make a disclosure by ringing up and saying, well, you know, I don't want to tell you my name, but, you know, hypothetically, or, you know, do I have to tell you my name? Or, um, and, and very often um, uh, those are very high quality disclosures. Because uh, in, in the whistleblowing research literature we actually uh, classify people, or we have a typology anyway, of um, the types of people who might blow the whistle from ranging from uh, people who are highly risk adverse, high risk managers, um, who are actually in fact very often the people who are least likely to blow the whistle. Because they're most, most likely to be the people who they may see wrongdoing, but if they're highly risk averse, then they'll say they'll be the first to say, "Well, I'm not sure whether I can do this safely, or if I do this, I can see what's going to happen to me, so I'm not going to blow the whistle." But very often, those are the people who, in fact, are most likely to see wrongdoing. Um, and um, from from that point, you can go through a, through categories of people through to what we call naive or even kamikaze whistleblowers who will who will blow the whistle irrespective of any sense of risk or consequence. Um, so, and, um, and so the trouble is, how do you get people who are risk averse? Nor and, and let's face it, most public servants especially are at least, at least a little bit risk averse. I had, a, I had a terrible day on my first day in the public service actually where, where I was sitting, we were having drinks on Friday afternoon with my boss who was an extremely senior uh, an experienced public servant who I respect to this day, best boss I ever had, and and uh, he said, "Oh, and you know, well, you know the old joke. What's the definition of a public servant?" And I said, and here I was, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, thinking, "Oh, here we go. This will be inspiring." And he said, "A group of people who sit around in a circle, and the first one to do anything loses." <laughs> and, and I was I was totally devastated. And I've spent the rest of my career. Proving that wrong, um, but the um, but uh, but but even if that's a terrible, awful stereotype, it still damages me to this day. The um, uh, but the fact is that everybody, if they're sensible, are at least a little bit risk averse. So how do you put in place systems and procedures that basically say to those who are risk averse, you know, yes, you can do this. Yes, it's safe. You can approach us confidentially. You can approach us anonymously. The reality is, in, in investigation land, that most anonymous, most sources that start out being anonymous will turn into confidential sources. Um, and so it's a matter of how they're managed so that their identity is, is kept under wraps um, as much as possible and managed appropriately. The difficulty is that in most organisations, it's actually very, very hard to keep somebody anonymous or somebody's role in the whole thing confidential <laughs> Forever. Sometimes it's very difficult to do it, even for a short period of time. Um, and so, in some of the discussions we'll be having about the practicalities of managing whistleblowing, the crucial issue becomes how do managers use the short window of opportunity when confidentiality can be preserved to do things that will contain and reduce reprisal risk or um, adverse action risk uh, 
as well as maximising investigative opportunities and all those sorts of things. That, that's the, the technical art in complaint management and investigation and witness management, which is what I often call whistleblowers, is internal witnesses rather than um, whistleblowers, is how to manage them in that process. So that's a really long answer, but anonymity is actually very, very important, but not necessarily because people really want to remain anonymous. Um, people really just want to trust the system in most cases. If you really want to remain anonymous, they can always you know, leak to the newspaper um, and suffer the consequences. And in many instances, if that's not justified, that'll be going outside the system and shouldn't necessarily be protected by the legislation. But if it is justified because there's no safe means of blowing the whistle, um, then, uh, then that's a different story. I answered that short question with a very long answer, but now there's two more, so we can please. <coughs> That's a very real question. Um, it's very real experience. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've, you know, I've, I've worked in an ombudsman's office, so I know what it's like. Um, the, um, um, fundamentally, those sorts of issues, they can be partly a question of procedures and the way the ombudsman's office or any other agencies are going about doing things, but fundamentally they also come back to resources. Uh, because the, the difference between a whistleblowing matter and a normal sort of ombudsman complaint, if you like, is that a large proportion of normal ombudsman complaints can be dealt with in a, dare I say, it, sort of fairly bureaucratic fashion that might take a fair period of time to resolve, and, and that's and that's just you know the way that it works. Um, but with whistleblowing matters, it needs to be, it's different, and it needs to be different. It's much more real time. Um, Whistleblowers, the average public servant is much more justified in saying, I want some external oversight of the management of this matter from the outset. And I know from my own experience of handling these matters that, that uh, you can trust an agency to do all sorts of things, but you can trust an agency to do all those things much, much better if the regulatory agency is actually looking over their shoulder at the same time. And that's just a fact of life. Um, and that's as it should be. That's why we have ombudsman's offices and regulatory agencies. Um, so, but it, fundamentally, their ability to do that comes back down to resources. This is a good time, actually, to identify that sort of issue because um, you might have seen that uh, I'm involved with Transparency International Australia and there was reference to the fact that we did a, a, an assessment of the whole integrity system, including the, the roles and the resources of the different integrity agencies. Um, and New Zealand did one of those in 2003 and next week the next one is kicking off here, um, supported by many of, uh, many of your, um, your national government's agencies and by Transparency International New Zealand. So it's a very good time to be squarely putting those issues on the table because it comes back to a question of whether the system is being resourced properly. Um, and it needs to be resourced properly if we're, if we're going... Basically, when I say that people are our best assets, uh, unless we invest in the systems that will actually maintain and enhance the integrity of the system, protect those assets, then you know, we only we just expect the outcome that we'll get. So, um, so it's, it's, there's no easy answer, but it's a vitally important issue and one that you know, I wouldn't hesitate to encourage people to raise in every conceivable way with government and their elected representatives, etc. Right. Sorry, there was a question up there. Yeah, far away, please. Um, I noticed that you had the, the English Act, and I can probably tell from my accent that I certainly wouldn't describe myself as an unsuccessful little bird because now I'm in New Zealand and it's wonderful. But the, um, the thing that stops whistleblowing in England is the defamation laws, which are very, very powerful. And 
Um, well, no, defamation is a problem. Um, and the whole purpose, one of the whole purposes of legislation, and this is how it does work in the UK, or should work in the UK, I think it does work in the UK, is that if a disclosure is a disclosure that's recognised as being a public interest disclosure under the legislation, then one of the legal consequences of that is that it'll override the defamation laws. You can't be sued for defamation if it's a public interest disclosure. Yep. Yep. Um, yes. Um, I mean that that's um, I mean that's a that's a legitimate problem. Um, and to the extent that where where any of these remedies rely on legal avenues, then um, they rely on legal support to make them work. Um, so the issues of, and this is, a, this is an issue that I think everybody is wrestling with now, is the reality of how do you build into these mechanisms cost provisions and costs indemnities and protections that basically mean that that, that issue, that the costs, the legal cost risks that go with any of these types of actions is actually covered off. Um, there, are, there are ways of doing that and it's another reason why um, embedding some of these defences more in, in parts of the legal system which already are low cost jurisdictions, which often employment appeals are, for example, is a way of, um, of covering <coughs> off against that. Um, the only other way is, uh, I mean, the other ways are to have public interest legal defenders available to meet costs. Um, basically what you need to be able to do is ensure that there's indemnity against the other side's costs and that whistleblowers have access to legal support to be able to defend or bring their cases. But the, the broader issue of, of using the threat of legal action to silence people is one that goes right across the board. It's not unique to whistleblowing. It's something that people who want to use that as a weapon can use it in all sorts of ways. The bigger problem actually in the UK now is, that, uh, is, is confidentiality agreements in settlements, in whistleblowing settlements, um, which isn't a defamation issue, but, uh, but it's very often the best way for employers who are settling whistleblowing cases who are paying compensation to their employees to get out of the public spotlight is confidentiality clauses in, those, in their settlement agreements that mean that nobody finds out about it, people can't speak up about it that way. So, um, so that, that's an issue that they're wrestling with in the UK particularly. Yeah. Uh, well, that's the general... That's always been the general... Um, Common law position, um, yeah, but but here you're not talking about here you're talking about the organisation having taken action on the unlawful behaviour. So you're not disclosing the, the agreement is not the vehicle for disclosing the unlawful behaviour. But anyway, another question. Please. Yep, up the back there. Um, yeah, no, that was on this slide. And um, very quickly, the experience in the US, which is where the bounty type systems are operating, has generally been not that. There are quite strict um, legal constraints on what type of circumstances in which a whistleblower, it doesn't actually have to be a whistleblower, but it usually is whistleblowers, who disclose fraud upon the government, um, can then claim a percentage of the, either the penalties or the, or the, the value of the fraud that's recovered. Um, the money that's rec recovered and then can, can, can claim that percentage as a reward. And it, in the US where there are some of these penalties and some of the frauds are just <laughs> mega billions in scale, the percentages when you're talking about 25 or even you know, up to 30 percent are enormous amounts of money. So there's a huge legal industry, well a substantial legal industry in the United States that, um, that supports this. Um, and, um, but the bottom line is that there are yeah, a number of legal tests that anybody who seeks to take advantage of those systems um, has to meet, which are, which are quite restrictive and quite onerous. And I don't think anybody's really ever claimed that, that they don't function sufficiently as, as gateways. Um, the problem is that they only, those mechanisms really only work where the, where the amount of money involved is, is big. And in jurisdictions like ours, 
the scale of fraud on the government or those types of penalties may not be big enough to, to, to mean that a percentage of that is worth it, really. Um, uh, and, um, and the problem that it only... Those sorts of mechanisms only work where you've got sort of financially quantifiable amounts of money. You know, you can't claim a, a reward or as a sort of a de facto compensation if what you've reported is not something that's, that's not financial crime or loss or hasn't incurred a penalty. So it's not a... It's, in the US, I think it's the only thing that's really worked well in whistleblowing legislation, um, but it doesn't substitute for needing to get the other things right as well. It just happens to be one element that, for historical reasons, has actually worked quite well. Maybe one more question, if there is one, and then... Sorry, over here, I've been ignoring you folks over here. So. Yep. Um, I'm just wondering if you That's a really good question, and it really that's a good question to finish on because it sums up the very interesting state of affairs that we're in internationally. It's like WikiLeaks has um, has lifted the profile of the whole question of whistleblowing and how we should be responding to it, and how the media should be responding, and um, how government should be responding, you know, like never before. Um, but the reality is that it's done it in a way which really has highlighted many of the complexities, the risks. I mean, who wants to end up like a Bradley Manning um, in Leavenworth Prison or wherever he is, um, has been for however many years now. Um, and um, and uh, it's also triggered a whole lot of measures on the part of governments to try and get control back over information and impose new restrictions on information and track how people may or may not be disclosing information. Um, so it's been a sort of like a double-edged sword in many ways. I come back to it as being, um, has it, having been a fundamentally sort of good sort of phase of history um, because, I mean, there's, there's no going back on sort of the new information age in which we're, which we're in. Um, it, it's demonstrated that in the new information age, even if not before, notwithstanding the fact that governments are finding all sorts of new uh, ways to try and control information, as they quite legitimately should, really, in many ways, um, it's going to be harder and harder for organisations to try and keep things secret which, in which there is a public interest for them to get out. Um, so it, it's force, it forces organisations and managers and leaders to basically adopt the principle of why don't we just really run the show on the basis that we don't have to be embarrassed about what gets out because it, you know, we're not doing anything embarrassing. Um, and um, so I think it's, it's, it has played a, a, a big role like that. Um, the other thing that it's done is it's shaken up the traditional media enormously. Um, the traditional news media, although it's being shaken up generally, um, has, was really caught out by the fact that you know, a lot of the information that WikiLeaks was getting had been given to traditional newspapers and not acted on or sat upon or not investigated properly. And Then when it's put out there in that form um, and it goes viral, suddenly it, you know, the full picture emerges. So it's really shaken up, I think, some of the, the way that the media thinks about their role, and I think that uh, has also been in a, broadly in a positive way. But it, but it sort of does emphasise that um, overall it provides a good reason for why all governments, all organisations, should be thinking about getting their own systems in place so that people can blow the whistle internally or to regulatory agencies or to authorities or to integrity agencies and have the system work. Let, you know, give, the, give, them the, give the system the opportunity to clean up itself so that people don't have to end up um, going down the sorts of paths that, that um, some of the sort of more famous whistleblowers have to go down. I think that's time because I know some people will need to get away. So um, if you're going to... Thank you very much. My name is Gary Forrester from the State Services Commission. Very brief closing remarks. Just wanted to thank Professor Brown very much for his visit. It comes on the 100th anniversary, as it turns out, of New Zealand's uh, Public Service Act of 1912. It's worth remembering that uh, in those 100 years, our reputation for integrity and uh, good advice and all of the things that go with that is sometimes very fragile and it's not to be taken for granted, but has to be reinvented and, if, if you will, reimagined with every single generation that we have. 
That's why a visit like Professor Brown's is so timely, because it serves to remind us of that need to refresh ourselves, remind ourselves, reinvent ourselves of these kinds of things. And so, without further ado, just wanted to thank Professor Brown very much for coming to see us, and uh, let's give him one final.